Hello, welcome to Community Haven. I'm Pastor Jerry, and this is our Wednesday Bible study. We're in the book of Revelation, and uh, we're going to cover three chapters tonight, the Lord willing, 14, 15, and 16. But uh, let's have a word of prayer first. Father, we thank you for this day, and we thank you for who you are and your mighty power, your saving grace. We thank you, Lord, that we sense and feel, we, we know that there is a move of God in the very beginnings happening right now. I pray, Lord, that you would sweep across our nation. America needs saved. And Lord, I pray that there would be an outbreak in all the churches across the denominations of your Holy Spirit, revival, awakening in this nation. And Lord, tonight, open our eyes to see spiritually and open our ears to hear spiritually what you're saying to us in the book of revelation touch our hearts touch our minds in jesus name amen all right we're uh we've been going through this just chapter by chapter mostly and uh this will be the first time we're getting three but one of them is very short one chapter only has eight verses so and i think we're just going to read through that one and not pause to comment very much um we're right here this is the timeline. So you can see the red line, that's the middle of the tribulation period, and that's where we're at. The tribulation is the longest part of the book of Revelation. It goes from uh, chapter six to chapter 18, and it's the biggest part of what Revelation is all about. We're right here, in between the rapture of the church and Jesus' second coming to earth, when he sets his feet on the Mount of Olives and uh, sets up his kingdom. And so tonight, we're just going to jump right in, and uh, uh, let me just say this. I, 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 I want to share this. I, I was listening to someone else, and they were talking about things that are happening today, and um, quoted from three different uh, well-known figures, one in economics, um, one in politics, and one named Hillary somebody. Anyway, and pulled out quotes from, their, from speeches they had given over the past several years, and all three of them said it is time for a global government. Uh, the world's problems are too big for any one nation, one of them said. Uh, and then another one said this, very honestly and open, he said, in order for us to have a global um, government, global economy, we first have to do away with any absolutes in the nation, and then we can enter into a global economy. Well, you know what the absolutes are. <coughs> God's word. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. One of the things that really grates on me, and it has for several years, and when somebody says, well, that may be your truth, but this is my truth. Truth is truth. You don't get to have your version of it, my version of it, their version of it. Jesus said, I am the truth. Truth is, hey, two plus two equals four all the time. It never equals five, it never equals three. It always equals four. The fact is that Jesus was a real person. It's a fact that he went to the cross and it's a fact that he went into the grave and it's a fact that he resurrected on the third day. And the Bible, the word of God is truth. It's a fact. I believe that. It's truth. <laughs> it's not my truth. It's his truth. And his truth is solid. The creator of the universe. All right, let's get into it. We're going to jump right into uh, chapter 14. Then I looked and behold a lamb standing on Mount Zion and with him 144,000 having his name, his father's name written in their foreheads. And I heard a voice from heaven like the voice of many waters and the voice uh, of loud thunder. Let me get to my notes here. And a voice like loud thunder and I heard the sound of harpists playing their harps. They sang as it were a new song before the throne. Uh, before the four living creatures and the elders, and no one could learn that song except the 144,000 who were redeemed from the earth. I, I can't skip this. Notice there's harpists playing harps. How many's ever heard we'll get to heaven and play harps? Well, there's the verse. <laughs> not to harp on it, we'll go on. In verse four, these are the ones who were not defiled with women, for they are virgins. These are the ones who follow, follow the lamb wherever he goes. These were redeemed from young, among men, being first fruits to God and to the Lamb. And in their mouth was found no deceit, for they are without fault before the throne 
of God. Okay, this chapter is another part of the pause that we're in right now. Uh, we ended this, this uh, trumpet judgments, the seventh trumpet opened it up the, uh, the bowls and we haven't been to the bowls yet. We've been in this pause. Chapter 13 talked about the Antichrist and the, the two beasts out of the sea and out of the earth and how they came into power. And now we're looking at a reminder. It's, it's almost like God is pausing. Holy Spirit says, okay, let's stop a minute. Let's remind everybody, Jesus is coming back to earth. No matter how bad things look, no matter how terrible everything is right now, there is mercy and Jesus Christ is coming back. And then it talks about the 144,000. Uh, they keep themselves from the idolatry and immorality of the tribulation and, and follow the Lamb. Uh, I know it says these are virgins, uh, have not defiled themselves with, with women. I don't know that they were virgins, kept themselves sexually uh, pure, but uh, it may be that it's, they, they didn't involve themselves in the things of the world that were going on right then. It's one of those typologies that somebody, uh, because we're married to God, we're, we're, we're uh, engaged, we're betrothed to Jesus Christ as the church. And so they kept themselves pure from the immorality, the gross immorality and the idolatry that's going on in the tribulation period. Um, they were also God's witnesses. We read, we encountered them earlier and they've been sealed and uh, they were protected. And now all of a sudden we see them somewhere in heaven. They're with Jesus. And it may be just a, a glimpse ahead to see Jesus at Mount Zion because Mount Zion is always a, a, a refers to Jerusalem, the holy city. And it may be a glimpse ahead or it may be that this is the time of their rapture in the middle of the tribulation. Whatever, here, it's, here they are. And there's Jesus and it's a reminder, Jesus is coming back. Hold on to that. Be comforted in that. As bad as it looks out there right now, it's gonna get worse. It's gonna get terrible. It's gonna get awful. And we're gonna look at the last half of the tribulation of the night, but be encouraged. Jesus is coming back. All right. Verse six. Then I saw another angel flying in the midst of heaven, having the everlasting gospel to preach to those who dwell on the earth, to every nation, tribe, tongue, and people saying with a loud voice, fear God and give glory to him for the hour of his judgment has come and worship him who made heaven and earth and the sea and springs of water. So this is the first of three angels that will make proclamations in this chapter. And the first one is proclaiming the everlasting gospel. Here we are again, this is God's mercy. Chapter 14 is, there, there are, a couple in the Old Testament prophets that said, in the, in the midst of wrath, remember mercy. And so here he is, in the middle of all this tribulation, just before the final series of judgments, we see an angel flying throughout the earth to every nation, every tribe, every tongue. Nobody is left out. I don't know how that's accomplished. Something supernatural happens because when he's proclaiming, uh, each person hears it in their own language. And they hear the everlasting gospel. Matthew 24, 14, Jesus said in his, when they asked him, what's the sign of the end and of your return? One of them in 24, 14 was, and this gospel of the kingdom will, will be preached in all the world as a witness to all the nations and then the end will come. That's a fulfillment. This here is a fulfillment of that. Notice he said this gospel will be preached as a witness. This is judgment. This is the judge. This is one of the witnesses. This is the everlasting gospel. One of the witnesses on the witness stand. This is why this is happening. This is why the judgment is, has come to the earth. So that's the gospel preached into all the, all the world, like Jesus said. Another, I ran across this, and I'll share it with you in Romans 10, verses 16 through 18. But they have not all obeyed the gospel. For Isaiah says, Lord, who has believed our report? So then faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. But I say, have they not heard? Yes, indeed, their sound has gone out to all the earth and their words to the ends of the earth. So even in the book of Romans, God was saying, this message of the gospel has gone out 
Some have been through evangelists. Some have been through uh, missionaries. Some has been, as a psalmist said in Psalm 19, the sun and the moon and the stars and the creation of earth testifies to God. There has to be a creator behind all this. That's part of the gospel, God's creation. All right. This angel also exhorts and warns because in verse seven, he said with a loud voice, fear God, give glory to him for the hour of his judgment has come and worship him who made heaven and earth, the sea and the springs of water. That's a good pronouncement for right now today because there's a little fear of God in the earth anymore. Even in the church, there's little fear of God. I didn't say it, but I heard Mar Mario Murillo say it in a conference I was uh, attending online. And uh, he talked about the need for being filled with the Holy Spirit. And he said, so many of our churches today, instead of the Holy Spirit, we have big screens, skinny jeans, and smoke machines. Putting on a show. No fear of God. God, we understand you can do signs and wonders, but we're gonna help you out with some smoke machines and some other things and some lights and stuff like that. I wonder what would happen if churches just were filled with the Spirit and signs and wonders and healings and miracles took place in the church. Huh? <laughs> All right. The second angel in verse 8, chapter 14, we're still in there. And another angel follows saying, Babylon is fallen, is fallen. That great city because she has made all the nations drink the wine of the wrath of her fornication. Again, when you read these things like this, you're wondering what it's about. Uh, fornication is uh, intercourse with the world instead of saying, staying pure to God. You're, you're getting wrapped up in the world and following after the world. You're, you're uh, committing adultery against Jesus. We're betrothed to him. And when we start courting and going with those things in the world, it's, it's the same as fornication, as adultery in the spiritual realm. So as we are reminded that Jesus is coming back to earth, now we are reminded that Babylon and all that she represents is about to fall. And we're going to, it's coming in the next few chapters, right? After, probably the next Wednesday Bible study. Third angel, verses 9 through 11, chapter 14. Then the third angel followed them, saying with a loud voice, if anyone worships the beast and his image, and receives his mark in his forehead or in, on his hand, he himself shall also drink the wine of the wrath of God, which is poured out full strength into the cup of his indignation. He shall be tormented with fire and brimstone in the presence of the holy angels and in the presence of the Lamb. And the smoke of their torment ascends forever and ever, and they have no rest day or night, who worship the beast and his image and whoever receives the mark of his name. That's a long-winded way to say this. If you take the name, the mark of the beast, worship the image, worship the beast, you're going to hell. Fire and brimstone forever and ever. Hell is a reality. And this warns of God's judgment on all who have worshiped the Antichrist and his image and taken his mark. The beast, he's called the beast in Revelation, but it's the Antichrist. The one who sets himself up as a world dictator and as a God. Remember, we looked at the beast out of the sea, the Antichrist, the beast out of the earth, who is the false prophet. And there's an assassination attempt on the Antichrist. And there's a miraculous raising from the dead. They're trying to copy everything about God. So as Jesus resurrected, the Antichrist is going to have his own resurrection. Whether it's an actual death or a near death, but it's going to be something that will astonish the world and they will worship him as a God. And so as we have God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit, this in this tribulation period, we're gonna have the dragon, the devil, the antichrist, and the false prophet. A false imitation trinity, if you will. So they end up in hell with him. Look at Revelation 20, verse 10. The devil who deceived them was cast into the lake of fire and brimstone where the beast and the false prophet are, and they will be tormented forever, day and night, forever and ever. I can't even fathom that, can you? And all who take the mark will be right there with them. 
Once, as soon as you take that mark, that's it. There is no repentance after that. Once you worship the Antichrist, the beast, and, and his image, that's it. All hope is gone. All right. The promise to those who refuse to worship the Antichrist and refuse to take the mark is in the next uh, passage, chapter 14, verses 12 and 13. Here is the patience of the saints. And here are those who keep the commandments of God and the faith of Jesus. Then I heard a voice from heaven saying to me, write, blessed are the dead who die in the Lord from now on. Yes, says the spirit, that they may rest from their labors and their works follow them. There's gonna be people saved in the tribulation and you know how they get saved? They're martyred. And that's if you survive all the collection. Listen, we're at the halfway point. I haven't mentioned this tonight, but at the halfway point, one half of the population of the earth is gone, dead. The church is caught up, raptured, and then uh, the, the seal judgments and the trumpet judgments, and it's all kinds of calamities and earthquakes and all kinds of things happening. And demons are released already. We looked at demons under the trumpet uh, judgments coming out and killing people on the earth. One half of the population. As it stands right now, we have an, a population of about 8 billion people. That means 4 billion people are gone. So if you want to think you're going to get saved in the tribulation, you first have to survive all the judgment things. And then you have to refuse the mark and refuse to worship and believe the 144,000 and follow them. You basically have to be killed, be martyred, be a follower. But that's the promise. Even in the, this terrible, awful judgment, there is a promise. Yes, you can still be redeemed. It's going to be a lot harder. It's going to be awful. And I don't imagine they will kill you right out. First, they'll torture you and try to make you worship the beast. Try to make you take the mark in your forehead, in your, in your hand. All right. We're coming up uh, to the last part of 14, and it speaks of two different harvests. We'll try to explain those. Verse 14, 16. Then I looked and behold a white cloud and on the cloud sat one like the son of man, having his, in, on his head a golden crown and in his right hand a sharp sickle. And another angel came out of the temple crying with a loud voice to him who sat on the cloud, thrust in your sickle and reap for the time has come for you to reap for the harvest of the earth is ripe. So he who sat on the cloud thrust in his sickle on the earth and the earth was reaped. This is the first harvest. Jesus spoke about this in Matthew 13, verses 37 through 43. And he answered and said to them, he who sows the good seed is the son of man. The field is the world. The good seeds are the sons of the kingdom, but the tares, weeds, the tares are the sons of the wicked one. The enemy who sowed them is the devil. The harvest is the end of the age and the reapers are the angels. When we get back, I know it said for the one, the son of man to thrust in his sickle, but he, he gives it to his angels to do. The reapers are the angels. Verse 40, therefore, as the tares are gathered and burned in the fire, so it will be at the end of this age. The Son of Man will send out his angels and they will gather out of his kingdom all things that offend and those who practice lawlessness and will cast them into the furnace of fire. There will be wailing and gnashing of teeth. Then the righteous shall shine forth as the sun in the kingdom of their father who has ears to hear. Let him hear. And let me say this. I believe that harvest, that, that separation is already starting. I believe God's already getting his church prepared. And I've heard several voices lately that I trust, uh, that I have confidence in, that they are men of God, uh, that God is already <coughs> shifting his church and there's gonna be separating. And I've heard one go so far as to say he's gonna bring down some who have marketed God's word and have done it for profit and for gain and for numbers. It's a scary time we're living in. It really is. Uh, but I believe this separation, separating the sheep from the goats, 
the wheat from the tares. You need to know this, wheat and, and those weeds that grow among the wheat, they grow up together and you can't tell which is which until it's ripe. That's what we read in Revelation said that, that it's ripe for harvest now. When it's ripe, you can see that the, there's a, a grain on the wheat that's different from the weeds. So when it's ripe, you can tell. Well, there's a harvest coming right now and it's going to be separated. And those who are truly following God, they're going to shine like the sun in the kingdom. But those who are lukewarm, far from God, with an imitation gospel, no real dedication to the word of God and to Jesus Christ first in their lives, they're going to be separated out because the wheat and the tares grow up together. That means there's things in the church. That means there's Christians and that means there's fruit and weeds growing up in churches. If I sound harsh, I don't mean to, but I've decided I'm going to preach the truth. We're too close to the last days to not preach the truth. This is a time to get as close to God as you possibly can. And let Holy Spirit strip you of everything that, that is like the world and not like the kingdom of God. It says, he who has ears to hear, let him hear. This is vital. This is critical. You don't want to be left behind and have to go through this tribulation that we've been teaching about for the past several weeks now. So that's the first harvest. The separation of those who call themselves Christians and those who really are. The second harvest is in verse 17 through 20. Then another angel came out of the temple, which is in heaven, he also having a sharp sickle. And another angel came out from the altar who had power over fire. And he cried out with... Uh, cried with a loud cry to him who had the sharp sickle, saying, Thrust in your sharp sickle and gather the clusters of the vine of the earth, for her grapes are fully ripe. Verse 19, So the angel thrust his sickle into the earth and gathered the vine of the earth and threw it into the great winepress of the wrath of God. And the winepress was trampled outside the city, and the blood came out of the winepress up to the horses' bridles for 1,600 furlongs. It's a long, long distance. And it's alluding to the fact that we'll see some of it tonight as we go on. There's coming a great last battle called Armageddon. And in that battle, there's going to be blood running. And, well, we'll get to that when we get to it. This is happening in this moment we're teaching about right now. This is what the tribulation is all about. The judgment of the earth. And... In this and in some of the Old Testament prophets, you see the wine of the wrath, the wine of the... Wine represents judgment. And the dregs of wine represent the harsh judgment of God. So that's what's happening. The wine of their judgment has fully blossomed and it's ready to be reaped. And so we come to Revelation 15. That's the end of verse four, or chapter 14. And in verse 15, um, it's, it's just a precursor. Uh, it's kind of a glimpse of here's what's about to happen, here's what's happening. And then in the very next chapter, we'll see the bowls poured out and we'll go through it very quickly. I'm just gonna read chapter 15, maybe make a few comments, but um, verse one, then I saw another sign in heaven, great and marvelous, seven angels having the seven last plagues, for in them the wrath of God is complete. I need to stop and say one thing here. They have seven plagues, and this time there are going to be seven plagues poured out. When we unsealed the seven seals, there were only six plagues, and then the seventh seal opened up, and it was the seven trumpets. And in the seven trumpets, six of them sounded judgment, and then the seventh trumpet sounded, and it was for the seven bowls. So each of the other times, there were only six different judgments in those series. This time it's going to be seven full judgments complete. That number seven is a number of completion. All right. Um, and I saw something like a sea of glass mingled with fire. I need to stop there. Just, I, I know I, we need to stop and give you the imagery. Every time you see sea in Revelation, it's not an actual body of water. It's people. It's a sea of people. 
And it says it's mingled with fire because judgment is taking place, all right? So there's judgment, there's a sea of people, a, a, a sea, vast sea of people, you can't see the end of it, and judgment at the same time. And those who have the victory over the beast and over his image and over his mark and over the number of his names, standing on the sea of glass, having harps of God. There we go again. You see, we do play harps in heaven. How about that? Who would have thought? But there are some that overcome. Again, in the midst of wrath, God remembers mercy. And those who refuse the mark are saved. They get killed, but they're saved. Verse three, and they sing the song of Moses, the servant of God, and the song of the Lamb, saying, great and marvelous are your works, O Lord God Almighty. Um, just and true are your ways, O King of the saints. Who shall not fear you, O Lord, and glorify your name? For you alone are holy, for all nations shall come and worship before you, for your judgments have been manifested. I wonder what the tune to that song was. Moses is a songwriter. How many have read before? Um, they crossed the Red Sea. There was, there was a song of Moses. There's another one in Deuteronomy somewhere, the song of Moses. And how many of you know that in, in the Psalms, and once in a while you'll see a Psalm that says a song of Moses. He was quite a songwriter. And here he is at the end of the age during the tribulation, writing songs again and they're singing. Um, I can't imagine what the music is going to be like in heaven. Can you? We think we've got it together and we're so professional sometimes. I think we're going to be so overwhelmed. Musicians will be embarrassed when they get to heaven and hear the music there. Verse 5, And after these things I looked, and behold, the temple of the tabernacle of the testimony in heaven was open. And out of the temple came the seven angels, having the seven plagues, clothed in pure, bright linen, and having their chests girded with golden bands. Then one of the angels, or one of the four living creatures gave to the seven angels seven bowls full of the wrath of God who lives forever and ever. The temple was filled with the smoke from the glory of the Lord and from his power, and no one was able to enter the temple till the seven plagues of the seven angels were completed. That's chapter 15. And all it is is a preamble to lead into chapter 16 when the bowls are actually poured out. But it's a pause. It's like, it's like a pause. It's like this is the last terrible thing that's going to happen. Let's pause for a minute and acknowledge this. Even in heaven, there's respect and acknowledge. And, and let's get to it. This is the last half of the tribulation. The beast has been in power. The Antichrist has been in power. The mark, the seal, the image, all these things are taking place. In the midst of all the chaos of the tribulation, he sets up his kingdom and is still defiant toward God. Chapter 16, verse one. Then I heard a loud voice from the temple saying to the seven angels, go, pour out the bowls of the wrath of God on the earth. The first bowl, verse two. So the first went and poured out his bowl upon the earth and a foul and loathsome sore came upon the men who had the mark of the beast and those who worshiped his image. So everyone who had a mark, everyone who had bowed down and worshiped the image, all of a sudden loathsome sores came upon all of them. Uh, it's more graphic in the Greek, but I won't get into that. This low, every one of them, can you imagine? Verse three, second bowl. The second angel poured out his bowl on the sea and it became blood as of a dead man and every leaf living creature in the sea died. We'll find out why in the next chapter but, or in the next few verses, but can you imagine every sea, the Atlantic, the Pacific, the Indian Ocean, the Arctic Sea, every sea, every, every salt, body of salt water you can imagine and now it's all blood and can you imagine the stench from every sea creature dying? If you've ever been near where fish were being caught or fish were being cleaned or where they were, if you've ever been near that at all, can you imagine what this is going to be like? It's going to be all over the earth. People are worried about global warming. I'd be more worried about this. And we're going to get to global warming here in just a moment in these, in these seven bowls. 
So all the, all the salt water turned to blood and every living, cre every living creature in the sea did. Third bowl. Then the third angel poured out his bowl on the rivers and the springs of water and they became blood. And I heard the angel of the water saying, okay, the, the first, the, the, the uh, last angel poured it out on the sea and it became blood. Now he's pouring it out on rivers, springs, lakes, fresh water. Anything that's not salt water has now become blood. And here's the reason. Listen, you are righteous, O Lord, the one who is and who was and who is to be, because you have judged these things, for they have shed the blood of saints and prophets and you have given them blood to drink, for it is their just due. And I heard another from the altar saying, even so, Lord God Almighty, true and righteous are your judgments. So the angels proclaiming, yes, everything's turned to blood. All the water, you have nothing to drink but blood. And you know why? Because you killed the prophets, you killed the saints, you killed our Lord Jesus Christ. You shed the blood of all those who were professing Jesus Christ. So now you reap what you've sown. How many know that's true? How many know there's a verse in the Bible that says you reap what you sow? If you sow to the flesh, you reap all these things. If you sow to the spirit, you're caught up in heaven and you're at the marriage supper of the Lamb while all this is taking place. Fourth bowl. Verse eight and nine. Then the fourth angel poured out his bowl on the sun and the power was given him to scorch men with fire. And men were scorched with great heat and they blasphemed the name of God who has power over these plagues and they did not repent and give him glory. There's your global warming. It's not anything we're doing. It's what God is doing in heaven. And if we do have some warming of the earth right now, is it a precursor? Is God saying, you think this is something? Wait till judgment comes. Um, they're being scorched. great heat and and yet they're still defiant um, they blaspheme the name of God in the midst of this judgment and punishment angels flying around with the everlasting gospel 144,000 witnesses have been preaching the gospel on the earth two witnesses over in Jerusalem, I imagine them at the Wailing Wall. They've been testifying, televised, worldwide television. These two people that witnessed to Jesus Christ said he is the one, he is the gospel, he's the way to salvation. And then they're killed, slaughtered, killed. And then after three days, they raise up from the dead again and then are caught up into heaven. All that's televised, the whole world sees it. They've had chance after chance. Two witnesses, 144,000 witnesses, angels flying around. Uh, proclaiming the everlasting gospel and yet still they're defiant and blaspheming the name of God. Can't imagine. Can't imagine. It's beyond my, it's beyond my, my comprehension. Verse 10. Then the fifth angel poured out his bowl on the throne of the beast and his kingdom became full of darkness and they gnawed their tongues because of the pain. They blasphemed the God of heaven because of their pains and their sores and did not repent of their deeds. Notice the sores are still there. So it's an indication throughout this that each bowl as it's poured out continues. There's sores. It doesn't stop when the next bowl is poured out. You still have the sores and here comes all the blood. And you still have the sores and there's still the only blood to drink and, and here comes the sun scorching and all the rest. It's happening all at the same time. One bowl after another after another and they blaspheme the God of heaven. Mm -hmm. That's true. What is it? I said it's like Job. They kept one right after the other, yeah, after, after the other. Right after the other. Bad news after it's bad news after bad news. Sores too. Yeah. While one was still speaking, here came the other one. That's what these bowls are gonna be like. Here's the bowl and you're, you're, you're dealing with all these sores and here comes the next bowl and all the sea turns to blood and all the creatures die. And then here comes the next bowl and, and all the water, all the drinking water on earth. What are you gonna do? And you've got sores. You can't bathe. You can't wash. Can you imagine turning on your faucet in your home? If there are any homes still left. Because there's been earthquakes, meteors, volcanoes erupting, earthquakes. 
Uh, demons have been released. Why would anybody want to, why would anybody not give their life to Jesus Christ? They're, they're talking here. They're saying, the God of this world, Satan, has blinded their eyes. And as uh, one of them mentioned last week, he's going to be so subtle. And, and I don't know. I don't know what the excuse is going to be. But somehow they're going to explain this all the way. Alien invaders. We're dealing with alien, aliens. Uh, there is life out there. And they've come and they're invading our earth. And all these things are happening because the, they will explain it away. And there's been enough movies about it that people will believe it. Revelation 16, verse 12. Then the sixth angel poured out his bowl on the great river Euphrates, and its water was dried up, so that the way of the kings of the east might be prepared. And I saw three unclean spirits like frogs coming out of the mouth of the dragon, out of the mouth of the beast, and out of the mouth of the false prophet. They, the Antichrist, the beast out of the sea and the false prophet, the beast out of the earth were demon possessed and now these demons are coming out revealing themselves. Verse 14, this bowl is continuing. For they are spirits of demons performing signs which go out to the kings of the earth and of the whole world to gather them to the battle of that great day of all God Almighty. Behold, I am coming as a thief. Let me stop a minute. Where have you heard that phrase before? He's coming as a thief to catch away his church. Now he's coming as a thief to bring the last great battle. They're thinking it's all going to be, be aliens and all this stuff. And all of a sudden they're going to see Jesus Christ on a white horse with a crown. And the saints behind him coming back down to earth. I can't imagine the sight of that. I can't imagine from down here on earth suffering through all this. And all of a sudden you see all these white horses coming with the king of kings at the head. And it says it's going to be, I'm coming as a thief. <coughs> They're going to believe all the explanations. They're not going to believe this is something from God. They're going to believe it's aliens or something else. And now all of a sudden God shows up like a thief, suddenly, quickly. Blessed is he who watches and keeps his garments, lest he walk naked and they see his shame. And they gathered him together at a place called in the Hebrew Armageddon. That's actually a, uh, it's har Megiddo. <coughs> We've been there uh, in, in the Middle East and we've stood on Mount Megiddo and down below it, there's a big, vast plain. So large and so flat and so... Here's what I believe. I believe that's where the armies are going to gather. Uh, it's where the final battle will begin. There's coming kings from the east. And if you read, if you want, if you want to read something that goes along with this, read Ezekiel, uh, Ezekiel 38. Put that down as a note. Ezekiel 38 coincides with this that's taking place right now. And the armies gathered there in, in the Jezreel Valley, just down from Mount Megiddo. Har is Mount, so Armageddon or Armageddon, Mount Megiddo. And those armies gather and there's gonna be a battle engaged and I believe that battle will engage there, but it will continue all the way down the Jordan River, all the way up to Jerusalem and end in the Valley of uh, Jehoshaphat, the Kidron Valley. The last great battle, forces of darkness, kings of the east, kings of the north, all kinds of things happening. And then God shows up. Jesus Christ shows up. <coughs> seventh bowl. Then the seventh angel poured out his bowl into the air and a loud voice came out of the temple of heaven from the throne saying, it is done. In the Greek, it's the same word Jesus used on the cross when he said, it is finished. Tell a test, I, I, look, I don't have it in my notes. But it's the same, same Greek phrase, it is finished. So Jesus said, it is finished, the way of salvation is finished. Now here he's saying, it is finished. The judgment is finished, this is it. I'm, I'm, I'm glad because I'm looking forward to Jesus set, setting up his kingdom after all of this. So he pours out his bowl into the air. It's going over all the earth. And a loud voice saying it is done. Verse 18. And there were noises and thunderings and lightnings and there was a great earthquake, such a mighty and great earthquake as had not occurred since men were on the earth. 
Now the great city was divided in three parts and the cities of the nations fell. There's some controversy over what that great city is. Most say it's Babylon because Babylon is falling. Some have said it might be Jerusalem divided into three parts. I don't know. I don't know. I know it's judgment. I know Jerusalem is going to be judged because they crucified the Savior. And The great city was divided into three parts and the cities of the nations fell. And great Babylon was remembered before God to give her the cup of the wine of the fierceness of his wrath. Isn't it amazing that wine is always associated with judgment? <coughs> Something to think about while you're sipping your cup of wine. Then every island fled away and the mountains were not found. Every mountain, this earthquake is so violent, so destructive to the earth, mountains fall flat. Every island is pushed out of its place. Then verse 21, and great hail from heaven fell upon men. Each hailstone was about the weight of a talent, a hundred pounds. Can you imagine a hundred pound, hundred pound, pound hailstones, a hailstone storm coming out of heaven each of them 100 pounds a piece. And look at the last part of the verse. Men blasphemed God because of the plague of the hail, since that plague was exceedingly great. They're still shaking their fist at God and cursing his name. I can't imagine the defiance continuing after everything that's already happened. And now, it's beyond me. We're going to pick this up next week and we're going to look at Babylon and it's going to talk about the fall of Babylon and what Babylon is and, and it's a false religion. It's a, listen, there is a false religion that imitates what God is doing. And, uh, there are, it's not just outside there, it's in the church. It's the wheat and the tares. There are people in the church trying to uh, pervert the word of God trying to sway people away from the one true God. Did God really say? It's what the serpent said in the garden. He's still saying the same thing today through his minions, his fallen angels. Got one passage of scripture left. It's in 2 Peter chapter 3, verses 10 through 12. But the day of the Lord will come as a thief in the night in which the heavens will pass away with a great noise. The elements will melt with fervent heat. Both the earth, earth and the works that are in it will be burned up. Therefore, since all these things will be dissolved, what manner of persons are you to be in holy conduct and godliness, looking for and hastening the coming of the day of God, because of which the heavens will be dissolved, dissolved being on fire, and the elements will melt with fervent heat. Knowing all this, and we've just read about it in Revelation. Peter is talking about all the things that's going to happen in the tribulation. All the things that John would write about in the Revelation. And knowing all that. Knowing the word of God. Knowing that judgment is coming. Knowing that that's going to be the most. Knowing that there's going to be an earthquake to hit the earth that will make every mountain fall. All the blood on the earth. All the water turned to blood. Um, demons released out of pits. Just a few Wednesdays ago, we, we read about the demons and the description of these demons that go out to all the earth and they have power to torture men for five months and then at the end of that, they have power to kill men. You're dealing with nature, you're dealing with God, and you're dealing with demonic powers all at the same time. Why wouldn't you want to get right with God now? Why wouldn't you want to come to the Savior and say, Jesus, I don't understand it all but I believe that you were crucified. I believe that you rose from the dead three days later. I believe that you are the son of God. And I ask you into my heart. I ask you to cleanse me, forgive me of all my iniquity, all my sins. Cleanse me and make me one of yours. Come into my heart. That would be a good prayer to pray right now. Father, I pray for all those who have been watching tonight. And if there's anyone that's lost, anyone far from God, anyone that has known you, but Lord, they've drifted away. Anyone that once was a part of your kingdom, but they left Father's house to pursue their own things, their own agenda. Self was lifted up 
instead of Jesus. Lord, I pray that you would open their eyes to see, open their ears to hear the word of God in their spirit, in their heart. And Lord, bring them to a place of prayer, a place of salvation. Oh, Lord God, let there be a harvest of souls before all this takes place. In Jesus' name, amen. I'm glad you could join us tonight. Uh, we're gonna have church Sunday morning at 1030. And we're open for business. We're open. Come. It's a, it, we've been isolated for too long. It's affecting our minds. It's affecting our spirits. We need one another. We need the body of Christ. I know you can watch and, and praise God for this technology. But oh, we need to be in fellowship and in the presence. We had the presence of God so real the past two Sundays. I mean, extraordinarily real. Worship has been awesome. And we've had altar services that just God has been moving in our church. You need to come. 2710 North Verity Parkway in Middletown. Just, just up from the skateway. And our service begins at 1030. And you are so welcome. You have my personal invitation to come and join us. God bless you. I'll look for you.